In this video, I want to show you the emoji equation of exchange, uh, which is my attempt to introduce you to what I think is the most powerful equation in macroeconomics, and it's the best way to understand what's going on in the economy. Um, we're going to use an emoji model in that I will try to relate some of these emojis to the important economic indicators and bring life to them. So the most powerful equation in macroeconomics. This is based on an identity which is the claim that total spending must be equal to total receipts. This is the foundation of our analysis now. And by definition, the total amount of spending within the economy must be equal to the total receipts um, made in the exchange of goods and services. Now, when we look at total spending, we can split this up into two different categories, two elements that contribute to total spending. The first, which is this big bag of money, is how much money there is to spend. Now, in this model, we're actually looking at growth rates. So really, this is looking at changes in the amount of money that's available to spend. And if there is more money then all else equal, we would expect spending to rise. But all else is not necessarily equal. So we also have to factor in the other component of total spending, which is people's desire to spend money. So this flying dollar wedge of dollar bills is telling us people's proclivity uh, or desire to want to spend the money they already have in their possession. Collectively, all this is saying is that spending can increase either because we have more money or because we wish to spend the money that we already have. Now, because total spending equals total receipts, we can link this to the right hand side of our equation. We can think about this shopping trolley here that represents the nominal value of goods and services being exchanged. So this is like the receipt that you get from a supermarket telling you how much you've paid for goods and services. Total spending must be equal to total receipts, but we can split this nominal value of goods and services even further. Um, in economics, nominal values are in cash terms. So this is what we're used to paying um, when we're engaged in a transaction. But we can separate the cash value into two elements, the impact of the change in price, which is inflation, and the real underlying value. So if we split up the nominal value of goods and services, our shopping trolley receipt can be split in terms of inflation, which is what's happening to changes in the price level and also the underlying real value of goods and services being exchanged. So I've got a price tag there to refer to inflation, and I've got a oil drum to refer to a very important commodity in the global economy. Okay, another word for total spending is aggregate demand, and this is probably used most often in economics textbooks and newspapers and commentators and things like that. I'm using the term aggregate demand here simply to mean total spending. A more common term for total receipts is nominal GDP um, or nominal income. Uh, when we measure GDP, um, we can take an expenditure approach, I look at the spending, or we can measure income instead and expenditure will be equal to income. These will be the same thing. So whether we call this nominal GDP, whether we call this nominal income, uh, this will be equal to aggregate demand. Aggregate demand is another word for total spending. So there's a lot of terms here, but because all of these terms mean the same thing and are equal to each other, um, then I think that it's uh, not as confusing as it might appear to be. Uh, now, don't forget that these are growth rates. So when we're looking at inflation, this is obviously the change um, in prices. Um, when we're looking at the real value of goods and services, exchange. This is real GDP and changes in real GDP. In other words, uh, real GDP growth. Um, now, it's more conventional to use an equation to represent um, uh, this model. Um, so traditionally, M is referred to for changes in the money supply. Uh, people's desire to spend money is often known as velocity. So V is often used in this part of the equation. On the right hand side, changes in inflation is usually referred to as P and real GDP growth. So real changes in the value of goods and services being exchanged 
is y. So we can say m plus v equals p plus y. Again, these are all growth rates. Um, but another way of thinking about this is in terms of our emojis. Now, I'm also adding another emoji here to refer to unemployment. I think this is an important part of what we care about when we're trying to conduct macroeconomic analysis. For our purposes now, let's just assume that unemployment is broadly related to real growth. Uh, it is normally the case that when the economy is growing strongly, unemployment is falling. Uh, when there is a recession, that typically leads to a rise in unemployment. Um, so let's not get too bogged down in terms of the economic transactions involved here. Um, if our main policy focus might be on something like unemployment, then we can deal with that within this model because of how closely linked it is to real GDP growth, which is why. Okay, let's see what we can do with, with this equation now. Um, first of all, let's think about the causes of temporary inflation. So based on our model, we can see that there are multiple things that can affect inflation. Uh, for example, if V goes up, if people's desire to spend money, people choose to spend more money than they did before, this would put upward pressure on inflation. Uh, also, if there is a negative shock to the economy, if there's an interruption to supply chains or bad weather events or something like this, um, then that will also cause a spike in prices. So we can imagine these short term factors, changes in desires to spend money, changes in uh, the real capacity of the economy can put upward pressure on inflation. However, the cause of persistent inflation, macroeconomists tend to agree on, um, is not because of changes in V and Y, because generally speaking, V and Y are reasonably stable. Certainly over a long time horizon, V and Y uh, tend to be quite stable. And therefore, the real uh, the reason for uh, excessive inflation is because of excessive money supply growth. Uh, in our model now, if we kind of white out V and Y and we have an increase in M, then that clearly leads to an increase in P. This is a monetarist position, which is the claim that inflation is caused by excessive money supply creation. And it follows quite clearly that if V and Y are reasonably stable and if we can exclude them from our analysis, then by the logic of our equation, inflation must be always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. That being the case, we need to recognize that typically aggregate demand changes will affect inflation. Question is whether or not it can also affect real growth. If we think about real growth, ultimately the driver of real growth is going to be things outside of this model. So the final emoji that I'm gonna to add to this model is what drives real growth over the long term. It's not anything on the left-hand side because ultimately all aggregate demand is going to affect is inflation. And what explains the increase in the real value of goods and services is what we refer to as productivity. So that light bulb emoji relates to productivity and it's productivity that's driving real GDP growth. Now, it may well be that we can get some temporary growth based on changes in aggregate demand. And so what we can see now here is that if the left hand side increases, either through change in M or a change in V, then we can expect there to be inflation and potentially some real GDP growth. Uh, but this is going to be temporary. There's a big debate amongst economists about the extent to which this holds, whilst all economists would agree that ultimately changes in aggregate demand manifest themselves in inflation. Most economists would accept that whilst the economy is adjusting to that change in aggregate demand and that increased spending, then there could be some changes in real growth as well. So let's think about ways in which policymakers can affect aggregate demand. These are the mechanisms of aggregate demand policy. In other words, how can policymakers increase aggregate demand? We can see there's two sides. Um, on the left hand side of this equation, M and V. So there's two different ways um, that we can try to do this. Recollect that M plus V just refers to total spending. So how can we affect spending? One way is by creating more money. So quantitative easing is essentially just increasing the M variable in terms of uh, total spending. Uh, the other 
mechanism is to try to change people's willingness or desire to spend the money that they already have. This can be done either by changing interest rates, it can be done by changing taxes, it can be done by changing government spending. So I think there's ultimately one government policy tool that allows us to affect M, but we can think of these three different tools that allow us to affect V. Now, if we think which of these are monetary policy tools, so which are the um, uh, down to the central bank to be able to administer, uh, quantitative easing is a monetary policy tool and changing interest rates is a monetary policy tool. So all we're doing now is just summarising the basic um, way in which central banks uh, behave. If they want to boost the economy and to increase the amount of aggregate demand, if they want to have extra spending, they do that by either introducing more reserves into the system through QE or by reducing interest rates. So more reserves or lower rates are going to lead to more spending. On the contrary, fewer reserves or higher interest rates are going to uh, lead to less spending. So depending on whether the central bank wants to make monetary policy looser or tighter, where they want to boost spending or reduce spending, where they want to have a positive impact on aggregate demand or reduce aggregate demand, they can use one of these two main tools of quantitative easing or interest rates. In terms of fiscal tools, um, so if monetary policy for some reason isn't effective and isn't working, policymakers want to try to affect aggregate demand without using quantitative easing or interest rates, um, then we can see there are two fiscal tools here, which are reduced taxes or increased government spending. As before, uh, governments have some capacity now. There's this link between the policy decisions they make, what's happening in the economy. Uh, generally speaking, they can lower taxes or engage in more government spending if they want to speed things up and to boost aggregate demand, or they can have higher taxes or less government spending in order to slow things down. This, of course, is controversial because the austerity debate is saying the extent to which lower taxes will necessarily boost growth or whether higher taxes um, will have a, an impact on growth. Um, economists will disagree on whether or not the levels at which these variables are at um, might have an impact on whether or not increasing or reducing them will have the purported effects. Um, if the fiscal multiplier is positive, it implies that lower taxes or more spending is going to boost aggregate demand. Um, some would argue that in some certain circumstances, the multiplier may be negative and therefore um, we can have a, a, a different approach. Now, if we're focused is on growth, so if we're not intending on simply increasing aggregate demand as a means by which we expect to have an impact on inflation and a potential short term impact on real growth. If our objective is to have a positive, sustainable, real GDP growth rate, then the policy that is missing from here so far uh, is productivity. So we've seen how we've got aggregate demand management capabilities. But if our objective is to increase the real growth rate of the economy, that's not going to come from either M or V. It's going to come from productivity improvements. So just to summarise those points, we can see monetary and fiscal policy as affecting aggregate demand and changing total spending. Um, to the extent to which when governments use their budget to try to increase the potential growth rate of the economy, I would refer to that as structural policy, uh, and that is affecting the supply side of the economy. We tend to spend more time when we're looking at newspapers thinking about monetary and fiscal effects because they tend to be kind of quicker in the impact that they have. Uh, but ultimately, what matters for long run growth in an economy are these supply side factors uh, and the structural policy that leads to increases in productivity. Another nice part of this model is that it allows us to gain some clarity over some differences between different schools of thought. And we can split modern macroeconomists into three main groups and see how each of them emphasise a different element of the model that we've looked at so far. Monetarists, as mentioned already, blame inflation on excessive money creation. Um, they therefore blame depressions or deflations or downturns in economic activity because of an insufficient amount of money supply. Uh, 
Um, if you want to understand why the right hand side of that equation might be too low, monetarists would argue it's because of a contraction in M. In other words, the key policy indicator that they look at is changes in the money supply. By contrast, Keynesian economists focus on people's desire to spend money, their confidence in the economy, or what are sometimes known as their animal spirits. So this is the V variable. Therefore, in a recession, Keynesians will be much more focused on trying to correct this downturn in business confidence and consumer confidence and use government spending as a means of lifting spirits and getting spending going again. Now, one thing to note about the monetarist and Keynesian position, even though they seem very different in the sense that monetarists blame the money supply and Keynesians blame people's spending decisions, both of those are aggregate demand explanations for business cycles. Both of them think that policymakers can sometimes cause business cycles, but also policymakers are in a very strong position to do something to correct a business cycle. Uh, they only differ on which policy tools are most effective, whether it's monetary policy or whether it's fiscal policy. By contrast, we can also think about a supply side model of the business cycle, which is referred to as real business cycle theory. It's real because it's not focusing on the nominal status of the economy, which is aggregate demand. It's concerned about the real side of things. And the explanation there is that the reason why we might have downturns is not necessarily because of any policy decisions, but because of the underlying capacity of the economy itself. So if we think of Y as being a measure of real GDP growth, we can think of Y star as our measure of potential real GDP growth. Whatever's happening to Y star is going to follow through into the economy at some point. So real business cycle theorists would say that downturns are simply just the response of the economy uh, to changes in the underlying capacity, underlying conditions of the economy. This is where structural reforms can become very important because structural policy is going to increase Y star and therefore mean that the economy can operate at a higher potential. Ultimately, all the aggregate demand policy can do is to deliver that Y star underlying growth rate potential. So hopefully those emojis has helped you to visualize the economy in a slightly different way. It's obviously much more common to use um, the letters that you can see on the left of the screen now. And I think that's quite an intuitive way to understand. But those key economic variables that we need to understand what's going on are all demonstrated on the screen now, whether in emoji form or as their letter. And collectively, they help us to really understand what's going on.